Okay, returning to the uh, the other visual interpretation elements. Um, this is an element that's not in the book, but it's usually um, treated. Um, the multi approach is using multiple spatial, spectral, and temporal scales so that you can better evaluate a scene. And so, for instance, both of these scenes are uh, from uh, in, the, in the vicinity of the um, mountain campus, uh, and you can see in the left the grayish area that is to the right central of the image. This is a burn scar. This is the, the hourglass burn, I believe, and um, and then there are various areas around there with various um, densities of of light to dark uh, red coloration. This is a Landsat scene that's been displayed uh, to look like a color infrared. Um, and then on the right, we have some true color uh, aerial photography for the same area. And what this allows you to do is to um, zoom in on particular areas and um, figure out with greater detail um, what the, the feature is you're looking at. <coughs> Excuse me. And one concrete way that this could be used is to identify training data that you could then use in a classification. So you might go through and say young forest, old forest, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, uh, open forest, burn scar, etc. Put that into your remote sensing package and use it to train the larger Landsat image. Returning to the um, elements of an interpretation, we're going to talk about shadow. So shadows can be used to estimate building heights, tree heights, um, as well as shape. Of course, you'd have to know the, the date, the time um, uh, of the image acquisition, but from that you could get a a solar elevation angle and then use the shadow lengths to determine building size. But of course shadows also block information so there's a draw there's a trade-off there. Um, on the upper right um, this is the Great Pyramids of Giza and shadow is clearly giving you information about the shape of the object. And then to the lower right um, We've got a bridge there um, uh, over a river, and you can't see the detail of the structure in the bridge, but you can see it in the shadow. So another way that you can use shadow to get at um, uh, object information. Shadow is also very useful in vegetation type identification and mapping because um, um, different, you have uh, different sizes of vegetation um, and you have different variability of size. And so the more variable the vegetation height and um, width, um, the more you're going to have cast shadows within the canopy that's going to give you information about um, the the structure of the canopy, but the, the key here is that in general, as forests get older, um, they tend to get more variable canopy structure. And so um, forest age or forest uh, maturity can be um, determined or identified from um, aerial photography where you can see the, the structure at a fine resolution. In the lower right hand corner, um, this is from the Pacific Northwest. This is color infrared imagery. And the area in the upper left hand corner, um, this is a new stand. So um, it's recently been clear cut and is regrowing. And you can see there's sort of a patchy, uh, there are red areas, there are blue areas. Some places you're seeing soil, some places you're seeing vegetation. So you know that that's just starting to regrow. To the south of that, we have a, a young stand, so you've got good coverage 
over most of the areas and you you can see that um, in that particular area that you're getting some shadows but not very much on the right hand side of the image is an old growth forest and if those of you who are not familiar with old growth forests particularly in the Pacific Northwest you have a high amount of variability in the canopy height so you have lots of gaps and as a consequence lots of opportunities for shadows to be cast um, from one tree uh, onto another tree site information so like i said this is putting the parts of the image in context so what's plausible and what's possible in the scene um, do you have factories in neighborhoods regrettably sometimes you do but in general you don't um, are there mansions in trailer parks if not you know unlikely so maybe that big building is something else um, are there supposed to be roads and wilderness areas again not not so likely so that all aids in your interpretation. On the right-hand side, um, do you generally have large rivers in desert areas? Uh, I'm sorry, large lakes in river areas? Well, no. So this is most likely, I mean, I know for a fact, is a, um, a reservoir. Another site uh, um, example, both of these locations are campuses. So the left photo exhibits fewer buildings, it has athletic facilities, and it doesn't have that much parking um, relative to the other campus there, which is has a lot of parking, um, very large buildings, um, multiple very large buildings, no really small buildings. Um, and that's a, a high tech uh, campus. It's actually the HP campus down at the corner of Ziegler and Horsetooth, but that's years ago. Um, a site example I talked about earlier. Um, so these are all power plants. Um, to the left, the circular object in the lower left is a uh, oil storage um, uh, tank. So we pretty much know what that is. This is an oil burning power plant. In the middle, we have um, um, rows of logs. So this is probably a chipped wood power plant. And to the left, um, we have a cooling tower suitable for use in a, a power plant, but uh, we don't see any sources of fuel being stored. And so that's likely a nuclear power plant. Um, more information about sites. Um, both of these um, locations are watersheds, but if you look to the, the left, that's a montane, it's a higher elevation uh, hydrology and related vegetation. It's a, a very well constrained stream, so you don't see a lot of meandering. So that's in a mixed conifer zone, um, I'm sorry, mixed conifer forest with riparian zone associated, and that's also up in uh, mountain campus. In the lower right, um, this is an example where you have streams that are meandering, okay? So you, there, it's moving back and forth. You can see um, both the meandering of the, the stream and some oxbows, those sort of semicircular areas that represent older, um, um, older parts of the active river. Um, that have been cut off. And you also see some fields in here. Um, it gives you a sense of the kind of place you're looking at. This is actually um, Fort Collins down near the Environmental Learning Center. Uh, again, pattern, I spoke before of, I'm sorry, pattern. Pattern is um, uh, reoccurring objects that you can identify. So remember we talked about texture, you know, sort of a reoccurring, um, um, uh, reoccurring um, objects, but the, you can't see the individual objects. All you can see is there's sort of a, re a repeated texture pattern. You can identify the individual objects. So that's that distinction. Um, in the left, uh, we've talked about this. 
you've got um, at the left that that um, that track is from the old Fort Collins High School, which is now the Art Center, and um, you can see very distinctly where you went from uh, pre World War II um, structure to post World War II, um, where you went from you know, closely packed houses um, in a grid formation to this sort of um, you know curving streets and large lots. Um, pattern in the lower right, um, you see um, dots at various um, uh, sizes and densities, and this is a tree farm. So you're looking at different stages of um, growing trees. More example of pattern, upper left-hand corner, that's actually a, um, it's a storage yard for um, um, Air Force planes that have been discontinued. Um, upper center, that's a series of different sized um, silos. Upper right, um, that is a braided river. Um, and those occur in very low uh, slope areas where you have high um, uh, discharge. And so you get this sort of unstructured pattern. Lower left, um, we have a pattern of dark and, and light areas um, that sort of give you sort of a ghostly impression of maybe there's a, um, a, a network there that's actually, um, it's an agricultural field or multiple agricultural fields. And what you're looking at is um, the, the pattern of groundwater. Um, I'm not I'm sorry, the power, the pattern of soil moisture. Okay, so uh, those are probably lower areas or areas that have um, finer soils and therefore retaining moisture, and those wind up being darker. Um, lower middle, uh, there I think we're looking at a, uh, a tree plantation, um, but we can actually see individual objects. And then to the lower right, another pattern. Um, I believe this is Paris. I hope it's Paris. Um, um, and you can see the overall structure or pattern of road development. More examples of pattern. Um, so the meandering structure of this uh, river, um, you know, with the repeated loops, you could consider that. Uh, meandering in the, the lower um, panel there. That's a dendritic um, drainage uh, feature. And so that occurs when you have high slopes and um, relatively um, erosible, I'm sorry, erosion, erosible. Uh, you can erode them quickly is what I'm trying to tell you. Um, but that gives you that kind of landscape. And then you have an entrenched example where again, you have these sort of me meanders, but um, wherever the meanders have cut into the rock, um, they're not gonna move very much um, uh, further. And then there are dynamic principles to keep in mind. So um, conditions change, um, therefore indications in tone, texture, pattern, et cetera, can give you information about succession and development. So young trees near old trees, if the young trees are, you know, in uh, uh, have an irregular margin um, with maybe some older trees in the center of those, uh, the young tree patches, then maybe you're looking at the aftermath of a forest fire. Um, and here's that example I showed you, you have differences um, in how the houses are laid out, but that um, relates to um, a, a temporal context of succession or development um, in how things were done.